Antonella Cardone, uh, Director of uh, European Patients uh, Coalition. We have uh, Hanna Horka from uh, European Commission, Policy Officer from PG Sante and uh, Europe's uh, Beating Cancer Team. We have Professor uh, Zielinski from Vienna Cancer Center and uh, European Cooperative Oncology uh, Institute. We have uh, Martin Smatana, uh, our Globsec Health Fellow and uh, Data Analytic. We have uh, oncologist uh, Dosan uh, Korec, uh, who is uh, Executive Director of uh, Patient Organization Onco Alliance. We have also distinguished guests in the auditorium from following uh, institutions, European and local patient organizations, European Parliament members, European Commission representatives, local parliamentary health committee members, Ministry of Health representatives, National Oncology Institutes, academia and scientific representatives, insurance companies, private hospitals, cancer research, pharmaceutical companies, professional associations, drug regulators, and national health information centers, representatives, and other experts. So welcome. I believe we will have a fruitful discussion. I would like to introduce and uh, hand over speech to our moderator, Senior Vice President of Globsec, John Barker. Thank you, Kamel, for the introduction, and welcome, everybody. Uh, the more often I moderate these events, the more depressed I get about the situation in Central Eastern Europe, but I really hope together that we can actually do something. I would like to welcome our first speaker, Antella Cardone, who is, as introduced by Kamel, is from the European Cancer Patients Coalition, uh, based in Brussels. She's gonna be talking about the mission, the role, how it can help to change or create EU and national laws to improve cancer patient outcomes, and how the uh, European Union can actually influence national agendas. So Antoniella, if you'd like to share your screen and your 10 minutes starts now. Antoniella, are you there? Yes. Yes, I'm here and... Um... Okay, so I will, uh, uh, I mean, do you see my screen? Do very clearly, thank you. Okay. So uh, I am Antonella Cardone, I'm the director at the ECPC, the European Cancer Patient Coalition. So thank you for inviting me to present on this uh, very important uh, uh, round table. Uh, as uh, the inequalities uh, between uh, Western and the European, uh, Western and Eastern European countries, and also within countries, uh, uh, is a topic that it is uh, very close to our uh, heart. Uh, so, just a brief in introduction to who we are. So, we are the largest cancer patient umbrella organization in Europe. We were established in 2003. Uh, currently, we have uh, more than 450 member organizations in uh, 47 countries, and we actually uh, represent the whole of Europe, but we also have uh, at least one member in each continent. Uh, we uh, advocate for patients to be acknowledged as uh, equal partners and co-creators of their own health, and uh, we work for a Europe of equality where all uh, Europeans uh, with cancer have timely and affordable access uh, to best uh, treatment uh, and care available, uh, no matter where they were born or live. Uh, our uh, strategy uh, since uh, 2019 and up to 2022 uh, is based on uh, five uh, main uh, pillars. Uh, one on policy, research, education and capacity building, uh, communication and governance. Uh, on policy, we work uh, to influence uh, the European legal framework uh, and uh, the European and national uh, policy uh, agenda. 
so we work uh, with uh, our members uh, to make sure that uh, uh, cancer is high on the political agenda in uh, member states, uh, but also at uh, uh, EU level. So we work uh, very closely with uh, the European Parliament and uh, with uh, the European Commission. Uh, on the uh, research, we uh, increase uh, the role of patients in cancer research as uh, co-researchers. Uh, what we mean by that is that uh, we are part of the largest uh, EU-funded uh, research uh, projects on, uh, on cancer. And on these projects, uh, we bring uh, the patient voice and we make sure that uh, uh, the, the patient voice is uh, included uh, from the design of the research, of the protocol of the research, uh, throughout uh, the implementation of the project uh, until the dissemination. And specifically on dissemination, we normally have a very uh, important role uh, as um, uh, we have an easy uh, outreach uh, to uh, over 2,000 stakeholders, including uh, uh, cancer patient associations, uh, research centers, and also policymakers. On the education and capacity building side, we work on empowering our members so that they can advocate for themselves. And this is very important because as I always say, cancers, cancer patients are the best advocate for themselves. On the communication side, we develop a number of raise awareness campaigns on the main challenges that cancer patients have to face. Uh, and uh, on uh, governance, uh, we work with our members uh, to develop a sustainable uh, model of governance uh, and cooperation uh, among all our members. So uh, cancer is currently the second leading cause of mortality in the European uh, uh, Union after cardiovascular diseases. Uh, and. Uh, 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 I mean, we have uh, every year more than uh, 3 million people uh, with, uh, which are uh, newly diagnosed uh, with cancer uh, and uh, an estimated 3.9 million people were faced uh, with the uh, diagnosis of cancer in 2018 and 1.9 million have died from cancer in the European Union. So cancer must be high on the political agenda. In fact, we have the Europe Submitting Cancer Plan, uh, which uh, uh, is uh, one of the major uh, tools now to uh, avoid uh, the current uh, trend uh, that will see uh, cancer becoming uh, the leading cause of death uh, by 2035 if uh, we do not uh, invert uh, this uh, uh, trend. Unfortunately, uh, in Europe, uh, as uh, things are now, uh, it matters where you are diagnosed with cancer, where you live when uh, the diagnosis of cancer reaches you. Uh, in fact, uh, patients in the Czech Republic are uh, nine times longer than uh, uh, patients in Denmark or uh, Germany until a new cancer treatment is available and reimbursed. In the Netherlands, uh, nine out of 10 new cancer medicines uh, with the EMA marketing authorization are available, while in Poland, uh, only two out of 10 new treatment options are available. So there are huge inequalities, the huge discrepancies between Eastern and Western Europe. And for us, the European Cancer Patient Coalition, this is unconceivable. We must act, we must do something as soon as possible today in order to uh, fill these gaps. Uh, and uh, uh, this is not uh, something that uh, uh, we can uh, delegate or that uh, we can procrastinate as uh, the right to health is a human right uh, recognized in the international human rights uh, treaties uh, ratified by the member states. And for this uh, right to be guaranteed, uh, access to medicines, treatment and high quality care must be ensured equally to all cancer patients uh, in the European Union. 
Unfortunately, as I mentioned, there are huge inequalities across the, 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 the cancer pathways and across Europe, starting from the early diagnosis. So there are countries where uh, the, 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 the diagnosis is accurate and, uh, and done uh, uh, very soon through uh, prevention uh, uh, schemes. Uh, early screening and screenings, uh, uh, screening programs uh, are uh, normally uh, not uh, uh, equal between Western and uh, uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, access to affordable care is not the same. After, uh, access to medicine, access to trials, uh, survivorship uh, care, and even the right to be forgotten. Uh, the right to be forgotten is the right that uh, cancer patients have uh, to have uh, their condition uh, as uh, cancer patients uh, deleted from their records when they want uh, to apply for a mortgage uh, or um, a, a grant or an insurance. And the, the, the right to be forgotten, for instance, currently is a law in, uh, in France, uh, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. There are talks to have it implemented soon in, uh, in Portugal, but uh, there is uh, nothing uh, that has uh, ever started uh, on, uh, the, on the right to be forgotten in Eastern Europe. Uh, so at uh, uh, ECPC, we uh, in, ensure that cancer remains high on the political agenda uh, beyond the conclusion of the work on the Europe's uh, beating cancer plan and the EU cancer mission. And uh, we definitely welcome the establishment uh, of a C dashboard, uh, as we believe that what's, uh, what gets measured gets uh, done. And uh, here I can also add very briefly that uh, uh, during the implementation of Europe's uh, beating cancer plan, uh, during the de development of the plan, we have had an active role. We have participated in a number of consultations uh, with uh, the commissioner and, uh, and um, uh, staff at the European uh, Commission. So uh, our voice was heard. Uh, for instance, uh, we managed uh, to have uh, the uh, cancer-related complications and comorbidities uh, uh, embedded into the, the plan. Uh, and while there was no mention of uh, comorbidities in the first uh, uh, draft of the plan that we saw. Uh, and um, uh, for the assessment, we are currently working uh, with uh, the European Cancer Organization and the FBA, European Federation of uh, uh, Pharmaceutical uh, Industries Association, uh, on uh, developing a sort of uh, framework uh, to uh, monitor and assess uh, the progress uh, during the implementation of Europe's uh, beating cancer plan. And uh, we hope uh, that uh, uh, our proposal will be taken into consideration by the European Commission, as we believe uh, that uh, the uh, evaluation, uh, the assessment of the uh, progress and, and success of Europe's uh, beating cancer plan should be a process uh, uh, public faced uh, and uh, with a broad uh, governance. Uh, then, uh, uh, so how can we help uh, to change or create you uh, and the national laws to uh, improve uh, the cancer patient outcomes? We definitely uh, can help uh, providing uh, um, uh, training and support to cancer patients, but also uh, we can uh, help influencing the local uh, political agenda. And uh, we can do that uh, through, uh, through raising awareness uh, among uh, politicians, but also uh, through uh, developing uh, fact sheets uh, based on uh, scientific evidence, uh, on, um, uh, based on scientific evidence, uh, not only on the clinical outcomes, but also on the economical impact that uh, different measures can uh, 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 can, can have uh, on the health system and the economical system in general. Donella, thank you very much for that. That was very, very helpful. And I'd just like to take a couple of points and I think we'll have some questions for you. I mean, I like the point you raised about keeping cancer on the national agenda. 
I was horrified to learn that actually it's a human right in the EU uh, for us to have equal treatment. So obviously this afternoon, I'm going to be starting to phone my lawyer friends. So it looks like we should be starting a class action. So you definitely got me inspired on that one. Totally horrified that nine out of 10 of the, uh, the population of Netherlands have access to, uh, they have nine out of 10 of the options available and two out of 10 in Poland. I'm sure it's equally dire in Slovakia and the countries surrounding us. So thank you very much for that. Now I have a quick question for you before I open up the floor is can you give an example of a country or countries which adopt cancer at the top of the political agenda? Uh, well, uh, uh, there is definitely uh, Germany, I could uh, mention. Uh, Germany is a country where they have a very good uh, uh, national action plan and uh, they have uh, uh, some very good uh, uh, implementation uh, tracks on, uh, on, on cancer. Uh, so definitely uh, I would say uh, Germany in, in Europe is one of the countries uh, that's doing uh, best uh, on, uh, on cancer. Okay, so opening up, are there any questions? You can raise your hand if you're online. The team here can actually ask. Maybe one question here, uh, and thank you, Antonella, for your presentation and, you know, to raise the patient voice in Europe. Uh, it's a question more around what, uh, you know, based on your experience and what you are seeing in other countries, uh, what would be your advice, you know, for uh, Eastern countries, Europe, or, or even in Slovakia, for uh, NGOs, patients, organizations to really raise the awareness on cancer and bring it into the political agenda? Well, what I would uh, uh, recommend is uh, to, uh, to work together with uh, policymakers, uh, that is uh, fundamental, and, uh, the, and uh, to identify the uh, arguments uh, to convince, uh, so to speak, uh, policymakers uh, that uh, any money spent uh, into cancer policy, into cancer action, is, uh, uh, is an investment. And the return on investment pays uh, not only uh, in the health system, but also in uh, any other uh, part of the, um, uh, uh, of the uh, e economy of the country, uh, because uh, the impact uh, on the return on the investment is uh, on uh, uh, social security, is on, uh, you know, the, the carers, uh, uh, is on uh, the, the, the labor market, uh, is, uh, is, is everywhere. And actually COVID-19 has shown in general that uh, uh, a, a, an healthy population and an healthy health system uh, pays uh, back for uh, avoiding uh, waste of money and uh, uh, waste of money in, uh, in other sectors. Uh, COVID-19, I mean, it's, a, it's an health pandemic, so it's, a, it's an health issue, but it had an impact, a terrible impact on any uh, part of the uh, economical system of, the, of, of a country. It had an impact on trade, it had an impact on the labor market, on, on, uh, on, on anything. So health, and, uh, and uh, any money spent in health, uh, mostly on prevention, because then, you know, if uh, we manage to invest in prevention, then we save money in treatment, uh, in follow-up and in rehabilitation. So, uh, uh, so prevention is uh, the real good uh, uh, investment that pays uh, back. Okay, so we've got one more question just to come up. And I'd just like to say, Antonio, that, that's final words I found inspiring. So let's go to... Tilman Kruger, many thanks, Antella. From a patient perspective, what should be essential features of the CE dashboard you mentioned? Well, uh, definitely there should be a benchmark with uh, the um, uh, some benchmark indicators uh, compared to Western uh, European countries. Because of the, the, um, the lack of uh, consideration, not only for cancer, I mean, uh, cancer definitely, but uh, in, in general for health, uh, for any other health issues in Eastern European countries uh, is unconceivable. And it shows, uh, a, I mean, I could say a, uh, a limited uh, perspective uh, from the policymakers. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the investments made in health uh, 
uh, are, uh, do not have an immediate uh, uh, return. So it's not something that uh, you, in, you invest today and you have uh, the, the impact uh, in, uh, uh, after a few months, uh, uh, but you need uh, more years uh, to have the return on the investment. And maybe this is a reason why not so much is invested in health in these countries, but uh, there is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, definitely uh, this benchmark uh, uh, indicators uh, should be included uh, into the into the C dashboard. Antella, thank you very much for that. And thank you clearly answering that question. And let's just uh, think about the fact that the governments have no problem investing in roads, in power stations, and the returns of the investments are sometimes over 50 years. And I think investment in health will actually be quicker than that. So I'd like to move to the next speaker, Hannah Walker, who's from the uh, Europe's Beating Cancer Plan Task Force. She'll be talking about the EU Beating Cancer Plan, the roadmap. I'm particularly interested in the fact that she can discuss the available funding schemes related to cancer care programs, because unfortunately, at the moment, from my opinion, it's all about the money. So, Hannah, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? <clears throat> we can. Perfectly. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, so thanks for inviting me to this meeting. It's a great pleasure to, to be with you and to hear also, and I hope that I will hear later on, the experience of um, Central and European countries in um, uh, how they see um, the, the problems and the issues uh, and what they would like to, uh, how they would like better to speak work with the European Commission. So I'm representing here European Commission DG Sante. I work in the task force, cancer task force, which is responsible for the implementation of the uh, Europe's beating cancer plan. This is a plan which was uh, launched by uh, Commissioner Kyriakides on 4th of February uh, earlier this year. So we are um, eight months uh, after the launch and uh, we are in the full power of the implementation of the cancer plan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, COVID and the pandemic uh, and the measures implemented um, influence uh, a bit uh, our our process but we are trying to catch up we are not actually the only one and as i said it is a priority not only for our commissioner who is personally involved in this file but uh, it is actually a priority of the whole commission uh, President uh, van der Leyen introduced the Europe's beating cancer plan and its implementation in the in the commission uh, work plan uh, uh, <clears throat> when the commission this commission started so um, maybe i will not go into the details of the cancer plan it's uh, all the information are publicly available we have done already and presented the cancer plan in the various uh, meetings so all the more detailed presentations are are certainly available uh, maybe just to mention that uh, we consider the, the action plan actually unique from the point of view that we really try to have a comprehensive uh, action plan, which goes from prevention to the quality of life of the survivorship to the palliative care, from inequalities to the research, from uh, specific um, Pediat or focus on the pediatric cancers to uh, initiatives like a tobacco control or taxation of alcohol. So it is really a um, very comprehensive and complex action plan, uh, which is uh, which brings uh, or which um, is actually sometimes challenging to to, to work in such a circumstances, but we believe that this is really uh, the need how the, the cancer should be approached or addressed uh, at the EU level. <clears throat> so in the cancer plan, uh, we have uh, 10 flagship initiatives, which are those which we consider um, or which we present as a kind of typical for each area, but um, 
they are not more or less important than, than the other 32 actions. We are now uh, working in the Commission on the roadmap, uh, which will be a more detailed document, which will um, uh, indicate actually around those 40 different actions with more concrete uh, timelines uh, with the uh, concrete deliverables. So this is something which we will publish uh, hopefully soon. Um, we uh, announced that it should be in October. And uh, of course, I should also mention that we are uh, very closely working with uh, our colleagues um, working on the uh, cancer mission, which is an initiative uh, based um, on uh, research and uh, which has a separate funding mechanism, but we work really hand in hand and uh, our objectives are uh, the same. So uh, cancer missions is one of the five missions of uh, DG research we have, uh, which have been formally adopted yesterday or the day before yesterday. So uh, just now, and they have a, <clears throat> they will help us to uh, implement uh, the actions specifically, uh, which are close to the research area. So um, as it was said, uh, money first. <laughs> so uh, we um, uh, really um, fight it to have a, a significant budget to be implemented on, in the cancer plan. It is estimated that it will be about uh, 4 billion euros uh, across the different um, funding mechanisms. So this is not only um, U European Health Programme, which is our programme, uh, uh, which we work in DG Sante, but it will be also Horizon of DG Research. I have uh, actually the slide. <clears throat> Uh, to show you uh, some other funding mechanisms. So Horizon Europe, Digital Europe, um, Erasmus Plus, uh, Marie Skl uh, Sklodowska Curie Actions uh, funded uh, on the trainings, for example. But we should not forget that the cohesion policy has a huge uh, possibilities for member states and the funding from the cohesion policy, uh, this is something which um, is under the um, competencies of the member states. So member states decide actually to which areas they want to, uh, on, in which areas they want to spend. We are guiding them, we recommend them, but it is up to them. And this is something which should be a uh, stress actually. Uh, to member states that there is um, options to fund many um, actions in cancer prevention, screening, early diagnosis, treatment, survivorship, infrastructure, research. <clears throat> um, so I, uh, today's um, topic is more focused on the uh, inequalities between the member states. But I should also stress that this is not only between East and West or North and South, but also within the member states be between the different regions. And um, the reducing health inequalities is actually a topic which is uh, cross-cutting. So we are making sure that each action which we are going to implement or on which we are going to work with member states and other stakeholders that we uh, make sure that the uh, vulnerable groups are taken into account and that uh, the inequality that we address the issue of the health inequalities. Um, we have uh, announced um, establishing of the uh, European um, Inequalities Registry, which is uh, uh, which is actually it has been already launched. It is a tool which uh, is addressing the those unacceptable inequalities and disparities which exist, and uh, not only between the member states but also between the different socioeconomic groups. 
Uh, we decided to do so because there is no uh, systematic uh, surveillance and reporting mechanism so far to track uh, such a disparities in the EU. But uh, it will not be uh, completely, uh, or we don't start from the scratch. Um, there is, uh, we are building already on existing data and indicators, which are being collected already, for example, through the European Council Information System, Eurostat, our European statistical system is uh, also collecting some data. So this uh, we will improve and expand. Uh, so the registry is going to be linked with the European Council information system and will make uh, available um, actually uh, comparable uh, up to the date quantitative cancer indicators in an accessible and systematic way so that uh, it's easily accessible for the general public and policymakers. <clears throat> So this, uh, we will work on, uh, uh, so the, the um, inequalities registry will be hosted by the Joint Research Center in the, within the European Commission. And we closely work on the uh, data collection also with the OECD. Um, and uh, which have already experience, um, they were, um, yeah, having uh, recently, or th they are collecting uh, regulated data uh, on, on cancer. And um, the, the, we will then produce uh, the cancer profiles with them. And uh, there will be, um, a uh, regular update of the kind of annual report on the state of cancer prevention and care in the EU. So, um, yeah, this is a uh, work in progress now. Uh, we work also closely with the member states. Uh, we have asked member states to nominate um, uh, representatives which will be involved in development of this um, inequalities registry and the we have established a thematic subgroup under the cancer member states group in the commission which will meet uh, for the first time uh, in a two weeks on 19th of October so it's also invitation for the member states to to help us to build uh, this inequalities registry in a way that it's um, actually helpful for for everybody. Uh, well, Hannah, I... Thank you very much for that. That's that's perfect. I'd now to like to get into the discussion, if I may, and just to, for sure. people to start thinking. Obviously, there is a clear budget, but we need to find out from you how we can actually access it. Obviously delighted to see that there's a cancer inequalities register being kicked off on the 19th of October. I think that's very important. So the first question I would ask before we go to the, the floor is what would your, be your recommendation on how best to utilize EU grants and the funds that are available? Well, um, yes, <laughs> this is a one million, um... Answer all billion dollar question or euro question. Yeah, <laughs> um, it it is very important that each member state has um, national cancer control plans in uh, in place and uh, updated, and uh, that they are having a good um, knowledge about their gaps and challenges. And so based on such evaluations of, of, of the national action plans, then they could decide in which area they believe they need to go further and they need to work less or more and uh, where they are already good. So each member states has a different um, different needs and we have a uh, different uh, programs which we can support member states to uh, to get the funding uh, for the areas which they need so it's actually um, 
rather for the member states to tell us in which area they would like uh, our support. And for this, we have uh, established this member states uh, cancer subgroup and the steering group of prevention and promotion, which is a uh, really our contact point, our links with member states, how we communicate. And it is not the one way communication from the commission to the member states. But we believe that it should be the other way as well. And the subgroup is not only um, representative of the Ministry of Health, which are in most of member states uh, responsible for the cancer plans, but it's uh, jointly organized with um, research ministries so that we also implement the cancer mission objective and the research objectives. Anna, thank you for that. I mean, it's brought a point to me that in certainly in Central Eastern Europe, we are terrible at applying for EU grants and getting the money spent. So what we need to see, I think, is something where we get published, where there is success, because I'm sure the other countries are going to be applying for funding being successful. We need to see the best practice. So anything we can communicate like that would be very, very helpful. Now, there's a couple of questions here. Uh, one from Darren Wilson. Uh, how will Cancer Inequalities Registry lead to actions to address inequalities for countries such as Slovakia, where cancer mortality rates the highest in Europe? Really good question. Um, well, um, the Cancer Inequalities Registry will actually uh, give a kind of the clear uh, signal to the or clear picture to everybody who wants to find the information there, where are the weaknesses and where we need to work more. It will of course depend also on the quality of the data which we will get, which, we, which will be uh, collected. And so we should not like overestimate the, the, the registry. So this will be a very useful tool, but the real work will need to be done um, together with our support with European Parliament, but in the member states. So that should uh, be clearly set. Well, it will be a reference document which we can use to shame some of the politicians in certain countries. So we will take that forward. And to answer... Well, to be honest, this is exactly what we don't want to do. We don't okay. want to have a blaming and shaming uh, tool, which would actually... Because we will... Uh, this will not be an objective which, or direction which Commission wants to, to go because then the member states will not share the data with us and uh, we, we don't, uh, so, so we want to use it as a tool to support the member states, not to shame and blame. Okay, well that's very nice comment, Marcel, please. Just, just one question, what elements are going to be part of this registry? What uh, uh, kind of outcomes are going to be uh, you know, part of the race. Well, as I said, so there will be um, actually uh, quantitative and qualitative indicators and um, um, and that will be also summarized uh, regularly in kind of the r reports which we will which will be published and it will be linked very closely to um, this cancer information system and it will be extended to which um, what exactly will how exactly it will look like I wouldn't uh, like to go into the details because this is really work in progress as I said we have just started and uh, so, so um, it will also it, it, it is uh, action which is ongoing um, and it depends on the member states which kind of data mm -hmm. They will help to. Um, they they will provide us. Anna, thank you very much for your very clear presentation. Thank you very much for your very clear answers. I think we've got some really good points to take forward there, and I thank you for that. I would now like to move to Vienna to uh, Professor Christoph Zielinski, uh, who is, as introduced, is from the Vienna Cancer Center and CEO Cooperative Oncology Group, which he is the president. And I'm hoping that he's going to show us some best practice on how the dashboard should be utilized. Uh, Professor, for you, over to you. I hope you inspire us and make me feel a bit better. Anyway. 
Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this discussion and of this uh, very important meeting. Uh, and it is important because it uh, sheds more light on the problems that we actually are facing in Central and Southeastern Europe. Now, let me um, say a couple of words about the Central European Cooperative Oncology Group. We've been doing a lot of research, clinical trials in Central and Southeastern Europe, published an abundance of papers, and have been doing also continuing medical education. And while doing this, we realized that we were sort of um, getting to borders which we could not trespass because of the unavailability of certain compounds and certain um, uh, drugs which are everyday, in everyday use in Western, and South, uh, in, in, in Western Europe. So um, we have generated this cancer dashboard for Central and Southern Europe, where we not only have analyzed shortcomings, but also have tried to define uh, solutions and to define um, actions. And we've been very much in close contact with uh, the uh, European Commission but even more so with the, uh, with the uh, um, members of the parliament group, which is, uh, which is, um, uh, which is uh, uh, sort of gathering around the, the, the cancer issue. So let me share with you a little bit the insights and the, uh, the, the results that we have generated. Now, we believe that uh, there are a lot of scientific achievements in cancer research including the improved understanding of the biology of different cancer factors and cancers, advanced in diagnostic procedures. We do know about the development of very sophisticated uh, uh, treatment strategies, including uh, the assessment uh, of molecular uh, patterns by next generation sequencing, and of course, an improved diagnosis and treatment. So there's an abundance of steps which have occurred during the last couple of years, in fact, very few years, and in fact, even more so since the 2004, when the Cancer Genome Atlas was presented and, and has generated the basis for further um, development of drugs and, and the targeted compounds. Now, uh, we have found uh, by the inclusion of uh, oncologists, uh, patient advocacy groups, uh, members of parliament, uh, national representatives, an abundance of uh, different uh, stakeholders, uh, a couple of shortcomings and uh, where we should really look into. And we find that um, uh, that cancer care in uh, Central and Southeastern Europe does not have only deficit in the availability of certain drugs, but in general in cancer care. So what we find here is cancer incident rates, which are particularly high in Central and Southeastern Europe, and this is particularly driven by lung cancer. Um, we have a lack in primary prevention. We have a lack in patient care. Uh, a lack in the allocation of technological and human resources, and finally, the availability and the access to and reimbursement of molecular testing, which then translates in the shortcoming in, um, in uh, the availability of drugs, because of course, uh, once you cannot test, you cannot, uh, you cannot prescribe certain uh, compounds. Now, cancer-related uh, issues, uh, which are to be ameliorated, of course, is the poor survival and high cancer mortality of a series of uh, cancer types, particularly the more deadly cancer types, which include particular lung cancer, but also others. Uh, we have almost in Central and Southern Europe no screening programs which are in place, and therefore diagnoses um, are made at later stages, and therefore they are associated with a much poorer outcome than they are in Western Europe, leading to a higher mortality than in Western Europe. Now, on top of it, there's a few uh, number of available treatment options, limitations and access to treatment, delays in treatment initiation due to red tape, and finally, of course, uh, variations in uh, lower and the delayed availability of novel treatments. As was mentioned before, the, one of the best examples probably is a drug which almost took 10 years uh, after its uh, registration by the European Medicines Agency until it was uh, literally reimbursed then, for instance, in uh, such a country like Romania. Now, what we would suggest, therefore, would be the implementation of national prevention programs and screening programs, as well as population-based cancer registries, which where they are done. And finally, of course, national cancer control plans. So that would be probably the first steps that would have to be taken. Finally, 
The approval of new medicines by FDA and EMA should lead to reimbursement of new medicines and a quicker reimbursement of medicines. And this should not be like uh, by an emotional, based on emotional grounds by reimbursement agencies, but, uh, uh, but on the basis of very, um, very clear methods, like for instance, the magnet of clinical benefit scale, which has been delivered and developed by the European Society for Medical Oncology, worth being a part of this working group, showing that this would be a very, very important first step to lead to the reimbursement decision after approval of new medicines by the European Medicines Agency. Now, another point would be the appreciation of patient advocacy groups. We find that there is a, a definite uh, shortage in patient advocacy groups and the shortage of, uh, of, 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 of uh, being, uh, them being heard in uh, Central and Southeastern Europe. So this is another aspect which should be uh, ameliorated. And of course, uh, an increase in access to clinical trials would be, um, would, would be of essence. Uh, and uh, these clinical trials should not only involve the availability of drugs, but also the availability of methods and also the availability of certain diagnostic steps, which would then lead to certain therapeutic measures. Now, um, of course, there is a uh, there was a discussion of the development of a cancer patient pathway. So that would be to record and document treatment outcomes and also show the difficulty of patients to get to certain, uh, to certain steps and the duration until these certain steps can be reached. Like for instance, diagnostic means, histology, uh, molecular biology, and finally resulting in appropriate treatment. Now, we find that there should be joint endeavors of healthcare professionals and patient advocacy groups where there are still certain feelings of alienation. So I think uh, that that would be an important, uh, would be an important point that, uh, that professionals as well as uh, uh, patient advocacy groups join ranks in order to ameliorate uh, availability of diagnostics and treatments in the region. And finally, uh, we should have this social education. Now, social education would be like health, um, health literacy, which would be the attitude towards cancer, but also its avoidance, like uh, the uh, avoidance of smoking, avoidance of, uh, of other, of other risk, uh, risky behaviors, which are very well known to increase the incidence of cancer. So this kind of, um, this kind of um, health literacy would be of essence in uh, this very setting and would be particularly important in this very setting because we all find, as you all know, that health literacy not only involves, uh, not only involves certain behaviors, but also the avoidance of certain behaviors. So that would be something which would, where, where governments should really start working on. Now, um, we, would, uh, uh, we would very much advocate the monitoring of key me metrics, which would allow to effectively scrutinize cancer care performance. So there is none in the, in the area which is in place. Uh, we would have to identify ways to improve cancer services. Again, there's none, uh, none such control mechanism in place to our knowledge. And the use of local data to make change happen because we, again, we don't uh, have any measures to, to, to look how these changes uh, are being implemented. So the cancer dashboard that we have designed is, uh, is uh, devoted uh, to helping people and governments to review cancer care in, Central, in Eastern European countries to assess and improve the quality of services. Now, prevention is an important issue, as I mentioned before. Tobacco smoking, obesity, vaccinations, which are of essence, of course, and alcohol consumption, again, another, another factor. So legislation or regulations would be important, as well as educational campaigns, as well as the dissemination of European code against cancer in schools and workplaces, and the introduction of explicit funding and support for cancer epidemiology. Now, there will be key performance indicators where I don't want to go into that because the time does not allow for this, but uh, the, to assess the number of patients diagnosed, for instance, with genital towards or cervical cancer, et cetera, will be of essence. Diagnosis, again, key performance indicators, which we have defined to increase regional coverage with state-of-the-art medical imaging tools, and also wait time for diagnostic imaging like CT scans, MRI, bone scans, 
and also the wait time until certain uh, molecular diagnostics are being made or um, other uh, factors which would influence the decision to, um, to uh, apply immune checkpoint inhibitor treatment. Now, systemic treatment radiotherapy, again, key performance indicator. We would have to increase number of radiotherapy machines where there's a shortage of in the, in the area. We would have the number of affordable new therapies uh, which should be reimbursed and then measured according in five, time, uh, five uh, year intervals. And finally, the wait time for uh, uh, not only adjuvant radiation, but also the uh, start of treatment of systemic treatment in this context. So we would have in treatment all these uh, aspects, the time before uh, between diagnosis and initial treatment, specification of treatment modalities, percentage of patients treated on a clinical trial, which there's an enormous shortage of in Central and Southeastern Europe. And finally, Patients of uh, percent of patients who are presented to a multidisciplinary tumor board. And another key performance indicator, the list would be also uh, where there are percentage of patients with documented evidence of multidisciplinary tumor recommendations or simply overall survival by stage of the initial therapy. So that would already allow us for, for the amelioration. Of course, all these steps are courageous. They need courage not only from governments, but also from people who uh, try to get governments to get to this place. But otherwise, we do not see any uh, solution how Central Southeastern Europe might catch up to Western Europe and uh, other parts of the world where all these, uh, all these indicators are in place. Thank you very much for your attention. Professor, thank you very much for that detailed talk. And yes, we'll be sharing the slides with the participants. There's a lot in your presentation which will certainly take back from us. I mean, what clearly comes forward is that the national prevention programs are essential and it's a place where investment will be seen very clearly, as well as social education. I would like to now move, because I want to keep make sure we're on time for the next two speakers, to the questions. So Kamel, if you'd like to pick one uh, from the board, which you think is the most relevant for this. Perhaps I might uh, choose the anonymous attending question, how to improve access to cancer medicines when authorities are publicly presenting that they do not believe the data and most of FEMA registered therapies are not effective and not able to prove in real practice the data shown in clinical studies? Well, the story is that we are living in times where, uh, where evidence is being put in doubt. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so this is not only in this context, but also in other contexts. Um, and um, I think that you should uh, express your thoughts about this at the next upcoming election. Okay, so we will take an action because obviously we're dealing with disinformation as Globsec. Mm -hmm. We're going to take notes of this question and we're going to speak to our team because this is something that is something we could work in parallel with what we're doing on, the, on these, uh, these activities. And to Jean Florence, I think this is a more general question. Is there an example of programs to enable cross-border treatments? So I don't know if anybody would like to try and answer that from either the previous panelists or panelists who are with me now. Perhaps this is also a good question uh, to you, Professor. You're working in Vienna uh, Cancer Center. You have some uh, good examples of uh, treating patients across, let's say, CE region and uh, how it works. Right, we do. Yeah, we do. So we have an enormous influx of patients from Central and Southeastern Europe coming to Vienna because, of course, this is the sort of next, uh, next or first stop, um, so to say, when the pl plane flies from Central and Southeastern Europe towards the West. So we do have a lot of uh, patients coming here, no doubt. Mm -hmm. And we do have, of course, uh, we do have, of course, experiences, and th these experiences are sometimes pretty sobering. And um, I would uh, really not. Uh, I would really not want to um, uh, to to see this continue. I think it is of, uh, it is essential that uh, Central and Southern Europe. And I mean, I'm not generalizing this, of course, but we do have enormous shortages coming from particular areas. And I think it will be important to work on the, an amelioration together, and particularly uh, in the context of the European Union, because we cannot. I I don't think that it's acceptable that the, um, that the European Union has uh, inhabitants who are first class and inhabitants who are second class. 
uh, in that uh, a certain part of European Union is, accord is treated according to best evidence and another part of citizens is not. Professor, thank you very much. And we absolutely hold power to be agree with that statement. And this was one of the reasons for starting this process and taking this action. So thank you very much. Thank you very you. much. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. So I would now like to move to Martin Smatner, the Globsec, uh, the Globsec Health Fellow, who is our sort of data hitman who horrifies us about why we're still living in Slovakia with the data. But Darren Wilson, I've noted your question and we'll come back after to that after uh, Martin has given his presentation. Martin, over to you, please. Thank you. I'm just waiting for my presentation to pop up. Perfect. So, um, okay, this doesn't seem to work. Uh, okay, so I'll just ask for the next slide, please. It does seem to be changing. So, anyway, um, I know that you wanted a bit of optimism in presentation, but unfortunately, I think this is going to be the most sad presentation of them all. And this is exactly the slide why this is the case. Because if you look into the, the outcome, the results of Concord program, which ended in 2018, uh, which summarized it, uh, cancer survival rates in all EU member states, uh, Slovakia uh, was in all but one group of diagnoses uh, below the average. And the differences uh, ranges from 2% in cervical cancer up to 12% in prostate cancer. And as you can see on the next slide, Yes, please, next slide, please. Yes, um, if you combine the above average uh, rate of death with above average incidence, because in Slovakia, we, uh, there's an estimate that we have roughly 30,000 new cases of a cancer per year, uh, you will get, uh, of course, above average rate of uh, avoidable and uh, preventable mortality, uh, which is shown on the following slide. Right, as you can see, Slovakia is sixth worst in terms of both preventable and treatable and the countries which uh, which are even further behind us uh, are countries such as Estonia, Romania, uh, Latvia, Hungary, which are countries which definitely are not regarded as the best in terms of uh, anything in relation to healthcare. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, um, I know that the preventable or treatable mortality comprises several diagnoses and several diseases, but if you look into uh, the structure of mortality in Slovakia as of 2020, you can see there are some COVID deaths already there, but uh, if you summarize the key four uh, of the largest groups of cancers, they will add up to 14% of all deaths in Slovakia. So we can say that great a deal part of the avoidable and preventable mortality is because of cancers and cancer-related diseases, right? Next slide, please. So the question is, well, why do we have such negative record? And there are several factors and, and um, um, well, reasons why this might be the case. It may be because of we uh, are not doing well in terms of external risk factors. It may be because we don't have sufficient diagnostic capacities, or it can be because we don't have accessible or affordable care. So let's start with the, the lifestyle and, and determinants of health, uh, which is on the next and the following slide, please. Yes, right. Uh, this slide is a copy based from OECD publication, uh, which is published on, on a yearly basis. It's called uh, Health State of Slovakia in Every Single Country. And the, the, the state, that roughly half, roughly 50% of all deaths can be attributed in Slovakia to behavioral or environmental factors. And as you can see, uh, dietary risks are the group which, uh, in which Slovakia is uh, roughly by 9% worse than the the rest of the EU. Uh, tobacco seems to be fairly uh, comparable to uh, EU alcohol as well, which is surprising to some, uh, but air pollution is uh, roughly double the, the average of EU. So as you can see, that risk and air pollution seem to cause more deaths in, in Slovakia compared to, to the rest of the EU. Uh, next slide, please. Right, and the next as well. Yes, perfect. Well, um, if we're trying to figure out why is the case that uh, the dietary risks or dietary factors are so, let's say, uh, you know, below average, 
Well, one of the reasons might be that when you look into the expenditure on prevention as a percentage of all expenditure on health in Slovakia, and you calculate it per capita, you will see that Slovakia is not only the worst in terms of all Visegrad four countries, uh, but it also uh, one only one of these countries uh, that is spending less every single year. And actually, as of 2018, which was the, the latest year in which we can compare these countries, uh, we spend roughly 15 euro per capita on prevention which is roughly one tenth of what the uh, let's say the uh, what the average of better performing countries in the EU is uh, following like this and the next one is when it comes to diagnostics I just looked into uh, a basic comparison of Slovakia and uh, the EU averages in terms of uh, screening rates of breast care, uh, cervical and colorectal screening cancers and as you can see in all of these three let's say major screening uh, the, uh, groups and diseases to be uh, lagging behind uh, the EU average. In some, such as breast cancer, it's actually significant difference. Uh, the following slide. It is true that this uh, information was last updated in 2018, and in 2019 we had uh, we called it the year of screening because a year before that, the National Oncology Institute was founded. Several, let's say, nationwide organized uh, screening programs took place or started. Unfortunately, during uh, COVID 2019 2021, most of these were put on hold or significantly uh, uh, reduced because of, of course, uh, lockdowns and all the COVID related issues. Therefore, we can also conclude that it's not only the risk factors, it's also uh, diagnostics, which is below par compared to the EU and the rest. And the following slide. And one more, please. Right. This, when it comes, let, let, let's look into the last bit, which is the availability of, of treatment and in, in, in particular to the medicine. This is a slide which is probably known to all of you. It's been famously known. Uh, it summarizes the availability of all oncological medicines which were registered in EMA, uh, EMA since 2011. This slide was produced by Association of Innovative Pharmaceutical Industry, and it concludes that out, out of the, all of the new drugs which came uh, since 2000. 11 Slovakia has 33 percent of them uh, registered. We have uh, more accessible, uh, but only through exemptions that health insurance companies pay out of their own budget. Right. The next slide, please. Uh, this, this percentage gets even worse because uh, you can have one uh, product, one uh, one drug, which can be registered for several diagnoses, several diseases, and if you if you recalculate the same uh, statistics, which was on the on the slide before that, you will you will find out that out of the all indications that came uh, uh, or they were registered in uh, MR since 2011, only 45 of them are in Slovakia, which is not 33 percent, but roughly 22 percent. And this percentage gets even even lower. Yes, it was a good uh, good slide. The next one. Uh, this percentage gets even lower because not every new drug is actually innovative drug. Uh, and and luckily for us, a European Society of uh, of oncologists, uh, they have their own ca uh, categorization of what is innovation in terms of uh, drug cancer treatments. Um, and out of the whole uh, the package which was registered since 2011, only 18 of 18.5 percent of of all of them as are actually registered and paid for in Slovakia. Uh, so the percentage is, as I said, uh, actually even, even worse. So the next slide, please. Uh, it is has not surprising that when you look into the, how much we actually spend on oncologic uh, cancer drugs out of all the budget uh, and compare it to the other countries and recalculate it per capita, so it's comparable, we are one of the, well, actually, we are we occupy the last place in terms of uh, value per capita, as you can see, and also our uh, annual cumulative growth is one of the lowest in the in the EU. This graph was presented last week by Iveta Palashova, the head of uh, AIP in 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 Prague, and it was prepared by IQ. Right? The next slide, please. And this is the, the something very similar, but it doesn't look into the comparison of of. Uh, per capita on of all oncologists. This, this looks into what is the share of oncology uh, drugs in comparison to total drugs in the country on the left. In the middle, it looks into the innovative molecules as I described before that. And in the last one, it looks into uh, the, the percentage comparison of uh, in, uh, innovative oncology molecules versus total oncology. Uh, the point is the same in all of them. We are one of the worst in the EU. And as you can see, we are always the, we occupy the, the lowest positions in the in the rankings. Right. The next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, well, and this is the last, let's say, depressing bit is uh, we know that we have some innovative treatment, we have some uh, innovative oncology uh, medicines. Unfortunately, the average day uh, that it takes for the drug to come into Slovakia yeah, to get into reimbursement standard procedure is actually you need 613 days in comparison to, for example, 120 in, in Germany. So it takes five times more day to get uh, into uh, uh, reimbursement procedures in Slovakia, for example, than in Germany, which is also very, uh, very sad and, well, not looking that good. The next slide, please. Yes. So the reason why we have such problems, and there are two reasons that I identified, and they're very simple. The first one is the budget limitation. Second is the legislation which governs the, uh, the, the process of categorization of the new medicines. The next slide, please. Right. Uh, and when it comes to the budget, it has to be said that we are sixth lowest spender in the EU. So we are the sixth worst when it comes to avoidable and preventable mortality, and we are also the sixth worst when it comes to uh, the, the expenditure. The next slide, please. Uh, uh, it is true uh, that in media, and the next slide oh, right now, yes, it is true that in the media uh, you can often hear, all about the Minister of Finance, that Slovakia spends one third of all of its expenditure on pharmaceuticals, which is true. Uh, Slovakia is the orange in this comparison, which shows spending per capita in euros. Uh, however, the reason why is this the case is because we are so underfunded, right? So it is not true that we spend too much on pharmaceuticals. As you can see, if we compare ourselves to the EU27 average, uh, we spend roughly about 25% less. But uh, considering that we don't have sufficient funds to, to uh, spend on outpatient or inpatient, we, it looks relatively high, but it is definitely not. And just look into the prevention, it is one tenth of uh, the average of EU. And the next slide. Um, during the COVID, Several countries uh, who that I would actually uh, uh, say that they are like low cost or uh, don't, they don't, don't, don't spend much on healthcare uh, uh, mentioned that they are going to significantly increase funding. For example, Poland, which uh, just a couple of days ago stated they are going to increase uh, massively spending into the healthcare. Another example is on the following slide, which was prepared by Martin Kutan from Bovera Health Insurance Company. This is uh, copy paste from his blog, which summarizes is payment uh, for the insurance of the state because you know the, the resources in the healthcare system can be from the ones who are actively are employed, so they pay the, insur the insurance companies. But for the students and retired, it has to be paid by somebody in Slovakia, Czech Republic, it is paid by the state. And this is calculated per capita in euros. And as you can see, uh, Czech Republic significantly in increased uh, the payment by the insurance of for the insurance of the state. In fact, they already announced further increase in the next year. Slovakia, unfortunately, is going the opposite way. There was slight increase uh, for 2021, but there was significant decrease in the uh, in the production of, of the revenues from the economic active. What is the worst thing and probably the most pessimistic thing about the budget is that today the Ministry of Health on behalf of Ministry of Finance announced that it's going to decrease uh, contributions by the for the insurance of the state for October, November, and December this year, because apparently uh, they have sufficient resources. So we are going the opposite way uh, compared to the rest of the EU. And the next slide, please. Uh, the one thing that has to be said is that even though we would have, let's say, 1 billion euro extra, uh, we would have to change the legislation because we, we are one of the few countries which has fixed ICER, which means that if it doesn't pass pharmacoeconomy for, which is very strictly said, uh, it doesn't matter how much money you have, you can't have it standardly reimbursed, you always have to pay it out of the budget of health insurance companies. Luckily, we know that there is a big change uh, in legislation coming. It is already in the process of uh, ministerial uh, commentary session. So I hope the next year, uh, if we are going to have the same session, I will be more optimistic than I was today. And that's it all for, for me. Thank you very much. Martin, thank you very much for that. Uh, pretty horrific, as a Russian once told me, a Pessimist is simply a well-informed optimist, and you are very well informed. And I, you know, the question which came up is, so, you know, what is the biggest issue to improving cancer care and reducing mortality in Slovakia? Well, I started thinking, is it banning language fried cheese and bringing in electric cars? But it must be more sophisticated than that. So perhaps we can have a bit of a discussion on that one. Yes. Well, um, on behalf of Globseg, we are preparing a large study. Uh, we hope to publish it for stakeholders soon, and we're actually focusing heavily on the risk factors. And you would be surprised to see how much we can do and how much we can change if you just 
uh, start uh, using a bit less salt and moving a bit bit more than, than, than its average. So there's, we, we roughly calculated several hundreds of millions of savings and several thousands of lives potentially saved if we really improve those risk factors. But the problem is it is extremely difficult to persuade people, please do not have a, a beer after the lunch, et cetera. Yeah. So it's very difficult to, to, to change the way how people act and behave. Um, I would say that we have a, a massive opportunity to improve all three factors, a group of factors I mentioned, because as you, as you, as you could have seen, we are really lagging in all of them. The, the thing that can be done instantly is the one which is in, in regards to the medicines, because it's all about changing legislation and increasing the budget. It is much easier than trying to uh, educate the new generation of people, mm -hmm. rather than to behave in more, let's say, healthy way, because it is something that takes years to actually do in comparison to changing a legislation and increasing the budget. So changing legislation to match the legislation that exists in countries which are yes. actually successfully fighting yes. cancer. Yes. That's what we need to do. Yes. Benchmark ourselves properly. Yes. We need to do everything, but this is the quick win, let's say this way. Okay. <laughs> All right. So do we have any more questions? I can see Darren Wilson, but I think we've most probably answered part of that on what are the main reasons for cancer care in CEE? Because we saw there was a clear statement of there is literally no screening, prevention, and these are the ones we're looking at. So is there any more questions coming up? Or Marcelo, you're, yeah, you're very active to, today. To ask a question, and thank you for sharing this data. I mean, uh, and the question is basically for Hannah, right? In situations like it's being just described by uh, Martinez Matana, right? For the data, which is kind of extreme situation in a country with the highest mortality, the lowest access. Is there any room for a proactive uh, approach from the EU, uh, EU beating cancer plan to really help Slovakia here, uh, you know, to even propose proactively a plan and funding to help to support the state rather than wait reactively that, uh, you know, Slovakia propose a plan. So in such a cases, can it be a kind of more proactivity from the EU and the EU beating cancer plan to support Slovakia? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Actually, uh, I um, I should mention and I should make clear what are the competencies of the Commission in this area because I hear very well, um, not only here in this meeting but across the whole Europe, problems with access to medicine, high prices, inaccessibility to medicines, uh, uh, treatment. Uh, I uh, also in the prevention, the the screening is a nice example because the. The coverage varies from 6% in one member states to 90% in, in, in other member states. But um, let's make here clear that the commission, uh, according to the treaty, the commission responsibilities in the healthcare is to support the member states. So we, uh, we, we don't have a competences to tell uh, or to give um, new medicines. We don't have a competencies for joint procurement of the non-communicable diseases. Uh, we have through the COVID crisis, we have seen that there is a maneuver in the area of the health threats, but in the NCDs, uh, can, which cancer is um, part of. So our role is really to support the member states. So I'm afraid that the, we can help, we can offer, but the initiative needs to come from the from from the governments themselves. We can support the NGO sector. We can help research. We can help uh, regions. Uh, but uh, I'm afraid that in 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 a, in this way, the responsibility is within the member states. So the governments have to want to do something, and you will support them, right? Yeah. Right, let's move over for the last the final 15 minutes to uh, Dr. Stefan Godrets, who is uh, the Executive Director of Ocala Alliance, and he's going to talk about best practice. And at the last session, he was telling us clearly what we need to do, and this is a very important part of the session. And uh, Dr. over to you, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. I really do appreciate the opportunity to present possible a solution, of course, not a, a magic one, but it's one of the solutions. Uh, can I have the first slide, please? 
Well, you probably know the slide. Uh, as you see, Slovakia, I cannot see that. Slovakia is number one in uh, cancer mortality according to estimates of cancer research for 2020. <clears throat> uh, when you go down the list of the patients, um, I, I know you know this slide, uh, but I believe that one picture says more than probably 1,000 words, and I'd like to go in some details. Yes, we know that money is one of the key reasons, or if not the key reason, but uh, there are other reasons, other factors that play the role as well. Um, look, for instance, at Romania and Netherlands. If you look at Romania and Netherlands, Netherlands spends several times more than Romania, and yet they are so close, so it's not the question of money there. If you look at France and Czechia, if you go down the line, France, if you, again, you cannot compare the money spent in France and Czechia for the healthcare or for cancer, and yet they are so close. Are there cultural differences between people? Well, again, not. Look at Slovakia, look, look at Czechia. Uh, the two nations could not be closer culturally than Slovakia and Czechia, and look the difference. Um, look at Czechia and France again. How close they are, and how much, how different they are in their cultural uh, cultural uh, traits, and how different they are in their diets. And yet they are so close. Are there genetics? Again, Slovakia and Czechia, Slovakia uh, uh, and Austria. Their genetics are cl very close, if not the same. Uh, people are trying before to identify the Slovak nation, try to find specific genetic traits. These are the real Slovak. They found the Central Europeans have the same genetic profile. Of course, that's given. And yet, how different they are in the treatment. Yes, it's money. Yes, I think it's different. Uh, there are different factors. And I'd like to talk a little bit about management, access, communication, and allocation of resources. Can I get my second slide, please? I think that was a no, but I'm sure it's coming back. So it's always <laughs> a no. Okay. It's coming. Um, this is coming from a completely different end. If you look at four industrial revolutions, it took 1700 years to start engines, railroads, and steam. We all know what kind of impact it had on our society, what kind of impact the first uh, industrial revolution had. Second industrial revolution, another 100 years, mass production, uh, electrical power, again, completely different lifestyle. Third revolution, electronics and computers. Again, we know how much it changed our life, what an impact it had. And look now, from 1969 to 2015, we are talking 45 years, and we are now witnessing the fourth uh, revolution, which is artificial intelligence. I don't think there is anybody here who would doubt that artificial intelligence is here, but it's not coming, it's here, and it's going to change our life. If we are talking that money is one of the key factors, although not the key factor, and since we know that money won't be raining from the sky next year or next or the following year, um, all the countries are now having problems with COVID compensation with COVID, the industry slowed down, so we cannot expect that money only will solve it. Uh, therefore, we try to build on the fourth industrial revolution on the digitalization and artificial intelligence and see if technology can have same impact in cancer care as it had uh, uh, in uh, other areas of our life. Can I have the next slide? We believe that we'd like to address all the aspects of uh, cancer care, all the aspects of patients' treatment. This slide you've seen probably before, I've showed it before. But we are starting from the primary uh, providers. Patient fills up a digitalized entry form, which makes sure, which we make sure that since from the very first touch between the patient and the physician, it is already registered and data collection starts from the first signs of the disease, from the first symptoms. 
the primary physician has direct communication with uh, the specialists with imaging, with biopsy, with pathologists. And everything is within the red lines, within the red lines, which are the ESMO guidelines. We will follow the ESMO guidelines. We will show how much it improves on uh, the, uh, how much it improves the quality and to how much it improves the success of patient care. If you look at, this, at the communication, we spoke with primary physicians. We know there is a delay in, on the, at the level of primary physicians. They say, well, we'd like to communicate with specialists. We don't see what they do to our, with our patients. Please make sure we get the feedback. Specialists say, please make sure that primary physician will tell us what he needs from us. The time from primary physician from first science to personalized therapy uh, in uh, our system is about 160 to 180 days for uh, lung cancer patients. Using this system, we are hoping that we will cut it down to 50, uh, to 50 days, which means to less than one third. Moreover, using uh, uh, the guidelines all the time, we will make sure that the patient will get at least the basic recommended treatment. Moreover, when we have patients which is well-defined by pathology, by morphologic analysis, genomic analysis, uh, artificial intelligence assisted interpretation of clinical data, pathological data, and ESMO data will provide us with the recommendation of personalized treatment. There is no politician, there is no insurance company which case can say no at that point. Yes, this is evidence-based. Yes, this is European recommendation. Yes, this is based on hard data. Yes, sir, please pay. Moreover, when we look at the blue dotted line, this is patient information. We want to include patients. We want to include patients from the very first moment to the last moment to see what stage am I, what is the uh, expected diagnostic uh, approach, what is the expected treatment uh, possible, what is the recommended treatment. Doctor, how come I'm not getting this treatment? Because it's not covered by your insurance. So make sure you write a letter to your insurance company. They will ignore it. Sure, they will ignore it for the first time, for the 10th time, yes. But when they get 100 letters like this, 200 letters like this, I cannot imagine they can ignore it. If we follow the uh, green line of communication, besides good communication, we will see the um, uh, results of the imaging, results of the lab. So we will have a reduced duplicity, reduced uh, uh, doubling of uh, tests, saving money. If we look at the artificial intelligence uh, recommended treatment, we know that we will not give the most expensive drugs to 10% of the patients, maybe to 5%, but to ones which are really the right candidates, which means we use the money appropriately, which means we use the resources the way we should use it. It's saving money, but most importantly, the whole system it's saving lives. By now, the system and the project uh, was accepted by the Ministry of Health, was accepted by our agency for uh, the, uh, healthcare data collection, was accepted by the uh, Ministry of uh, Digitalization Informatics. We are hoping that uh, within a month we'll have completed um, um, a request for EU support, and we are uh, trying to get various uh, sources for support. And again, in the end, we believe we'll save money, we'll save life, we will uh, we'll shorten diagnostic time, which means we will treat the patient at earlier stage more successfully. And we hope that our patient will be better educated and taking part of their treatment decision. Uh, a last point, the digitalized archive you see there, it's a uh, digitalized pathology that will be sent to digitalized archive. It's part of the biobank uh, um, project, which is already ongoing, which means if the slide, uh, if the digitalized slide, uh, digitalized pathology findings come from different places, different sources, 
the archive will either take it, accept it, or if it doesn't meet uh, fit the criteria, doesn't meet uh, all the necessary uh, parameters, it will reject it for a second uh, review, which means we will have um, equal um, equalized diagnosis and we will have better data and we will be able to talk more to the point. I think this is all what I wanted to say. Hopefully, again, this is not solving everything, but yes, it is involving people, communication, hopefully influencing system, and hopefully improving access to new treatment for the patient as they come. Thank so, you very much. Stefan, thank you very much. That was very clear. We have three minutes to wrap up, so I'm looking for some questions. There is one I think we can talk about, and that was the project you were describing. I mean, this looks like in all the, let's say, the, the pessimism and everything, there could be a shining light, which could be Slovakia actually showing some best practice. Hopefully, oh, yes. Yes. And do you see your NGO as part of the way to actually, let's say, inform the government and actually work with the government? Or how, how do you think you can help? Thank you for the question. Um, there is a basic rule in our country, but in, in more, most of the countries, if the order comes from above, from the government for the physicians, you have to do it. The first reaction is negative. Mm -hmm. However, if the uh, request comes from uh, uh, civic organizations, including uh, patient organizations, our organization includes six patient organizations, includes pharma companies, include, include Globsec, um, Amcham, so if it comes from, the, from below, physicians accept it more and Ministry of Health also accepted it will be partnership. Therefore, it's starting from the Oncology Alliance. We were the ones who developed the project, but right now we are trying to um, get it accepted by the population uh, jointly with the Ministry of Health. So it's from below and it's a joint project between the government and civic organizations. So we can't just beat the government, civil society has to do something as well to make exactly. the government move, right? That's a really good point. So do we have a question which could go to any of the panelists? One final question before we wrap up and summarize. I can make a comment. It's Antonella Cardone, uh, ECPC. I would uh, just uh, like to make a comment on uh, this uh, last uh, uh, project. I mean, I think uh, that uh, it's uh, it is the way to go. It's a very good model. Uh, it is very very important uh, to have all the stakeholders uh, involved uh, when uh, uh, a change uh, uh, is in uh, is in the agenda. And you know, uh, and it's uh, it, it it's very important uh, to involve uh, physicians, uh, to involve uh, patients, and policymakers at the same level. So I, I totally, I'm totally aligned uh, with uh, with that. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Thank you very much. I would thank like you. to thank everybody for their participation. I would like to thank the panelists. I'm going to take away the fact that the quality of treatment is a human right. There's four billion available, but it proves that it's not just about the money. With Romania matching the standards of, let's say, the Netherlands in some areas, we need to look at that. Some real clear information from Martin, it wasn't maybe a way to turn it around is in Slovakia, you know, we don't have access to 81.5% of the treatments that are available. It is terrible. There are ways of changing it by bringing in AI. Uh, prevention, there is really not a national drive in Central Europe on this side, and this is something we have to focus on. I would like to thank you very much. The time is up. I hope you have a rest of a good afternoon and a good weekend. It's exactly 15.30. So thank you, everybody, one for your attendance. And a round of applause, please, to the panelists. Thank you very much, Ron, for moderating. And I would just uh, inform the audience that uh, there will be the press release coming after this uh, webinar. And uh, based on the agreement with these speakers, uh, we will share uh, the slide content and the outcome report also will follow. So thank you once again, and uh, wish you have a nice rest of the day and weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.